Grace, mercy, and peace to you. From God our Father and our Lord and our Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. When you first hear this story from Luke, the Gerasian demoniac, this is sort of a weird, bizarre New Testament story. You got demons possessing a naked man who's ranting and raving and living in tombstones and cemeteries. Chains try to shackle him, yet he can't break, or he breaks them anyway. They're around his feet. You got the presence of pigs. You got them running over cliffs. You got death. Then you got conflict after it. Just weird stuff going on in here. And it's interesting, as I look, biblical scholars tend to do three things with these bizarre, bizarre, more bizarre New Testament texts. One, they tend to rationalize it. They end up saying the man really had a uh, psychological, physical disorder, and really today what we need to do is get him into good mental health care facility somewhere. Or else they literalize it where it is some kind of miraculous happening, but the more you literalize it and the more miraculous it becomes, the less it really applies to anything about what I am here today. Or they end up saying it's irrelevant and they just skip it all together in the 21st century. Yet of all the illustrations of Jesus casting out demons in the New Testament, this is the longest and it is the most elaborate. And if Luke goes to such a length to tell us this story, I think maybe the least we should do is try to pay attention to it. And so what I invite you to do this morning is the same thing Lydia will invite you to do on Saturday morning and take away your thoughts and your needs and your social and put it aside and let the text begin to speak to you. And as you look at it that way, you begin to realize the writer of Luke, the writer of Luke's Gospel, he uses these bridge phrases. These phrases all throughout his gospel, and they sort of tie the texts and the stories and the events all together so it begins to make sense. And there is a bridge phrase to today's text, and it goes back to the 8th chapter, the first verse. And there it says, Jesus went on through the cities and the villages, proclaiming and bringing the good news of the kingdom of God. Doesn't sound like a tremendous phrase when you first hear it, but for people in the first century, that would have really shocked them. Because you see, thousands and thousands of people had talked about the kingdom of God. Thousands and thousands of people had talked about the Messiah. But all that talk had never led to the kingdom of God coming. Now there is a man who not only talks about the kingdom of God, but he is the one that brings it. His word has power. The power to bring about what it says. And immediately after that bridge phrase, you go into the 8th chapter, and there's a whole series of Jesus' teaching where he proclaims what this kingdom of God thing is. And they're immediately followed up by this series of miracles where now what that kingdom of God is, you see it unfolding right now in your midst. It's not enough to talk about it. Jesus is it. He brings the good news. He is the good news. And what is the good news? Isn't it fun when you preach? You can ask the questions and then answer them. You know, I always like that. You know, you ask the question. It's like a bridge phrase now. We're going here. See, this is my own little bridge phrase. What is the good news? You heard it. You heard it read in that second lesson. And it is wonderful. For in Jesus Christ, you are all children of God through faith. Faith is trusting what God says. And more than just trusting what he says, when you hear that word, you believe God's word has the power to make it come into existence to accomplish what it says. And now here in Luke's story of this Gerasian demoniac, you begin to see this kingdom of God breaking in right there. And it begins to claim that this is a child of God, not a child of the... Uh, it happens because Jesus needs a vacation. How many of you are here on vacation? <laughs> he didn't come to Kauai. He should have. He really should have. <laughs> he didn't come to Kauai. He went to Gerasene. Gerasene is southeast in the Lake of Galilee. It is Gentile. It is actually a Greek region. It is not Hebrew. <laughs> and one of the things you begin to see in here is you can take a vacation from what you do. And we all need to take a vacation once in a while from what we do. But you cannot take a vacation from who you are. And you cannot take a vacation from yourself. 
Jesus is this good news of the kingdom of God. So when he goes to this place, he is this kingdom of God there. And so in an unexpected place, to a very unexpected person, Jesus is still the presence of God. This unexpected person, a naked man living in the cemetery possessed by demons. Demons, in the New Testament time, demons are powerful, powerful creatures. But they're not like we see in our cinema and television shows. So demons literally are very similar to the Spirit of God. Spirit of God is breath, word. It is a word that is spoken. It's a word that goes inside of you. It's a word then that begins to shape and mold who and what you are. That old phrase I always grew up with, my father taught me as a good German father, sticks and stones may break your bones, but words will never hurt you. <coughs> the exact opposite is true. Words can hurt you a whole lot more than sticks and stones, and they have power to get inside and reshape who you think you are. The difference between demons and the Spirit of God, the demons live in the cemetery. They lead you away from life and into death. It is these kinds of spirits that begin to say you are no longer free, but you are enslaved. They begin to speak demeaning and they devalue. They pull you away from the love of God and each other. They begin to be words of condemnation and punishment. Words of stereotype that divide instead of life and forgiveness. We begin to live in death and resentment. And here's the first wonderfully interesting thing. The demons immediately know who Jesus is. And they know exactly what Jesus is there to do. The demons know that their word, their spirit, can't exist in this man. At the same time, God's word, God's spirit, can exist in that man. The two cannot exist in the same place at the same time. And there's literally, literally a war of words going on. And Jesus says, my word, my word of life means that this demonic word, that you are not living, that you are less than, has to be cut out. You know, in some ways, I think the demons are smarter than we are. The demons knew you could have one or the other, but you couldn't have both. I think I can have both. I think I can come to church and be a real nice guy here on Sunday morning. And I can look pretty and dress up and up. And then Monday through Friday, I can live my life my way. <coughs> And yet the demons know, no, 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 no. Either it is the power of the Spirit of God that holds you, and you visit in the world, or it is the world that holds you, and you visit when you come to church. As Jesus confronts this demon, the first thing he asks is, what is your name? And his name is Legion. He is in Rome, Greek. Legion was 5,000, 6,000 troops from the Roman. It isn't so much a description, that's the name. It is more of a description, this is what is present. And it is all the power and the weight of the world. And it is sitting on this man trying to define him and define who and what he is. And in the midst of all that weight that everything the world can muster, this Jesus comes and says, no. From his shackles and his chains, and that word goes into the pigs. The pig was the quintessential symbol of that which is unclean. Everything that separates you from this word of God. It goes into all that would separate us from this love of God. And it drives it into the bottom of the sea. And that's where in Hebrew understanding, God would imprison all the demons and other disobedient spirits. All the other words that will not adhere to God's word. And they are swallowed up into the sea. Isn't this just a great event for the man living in the cemetery in Gerasene? But here's the preacher question. What in the world does that have to do with you and me when you're sitting on a hard bench and it's getting hot and you're wondering how long can the preacher keep going? <laughs> I think legions are still here. The power of the world to define us to try to control us, to dictate who we are. The average American listens to 285 commercials a day. That is 1,995 a week. That is 101,740 a year. There are spirits of legions, spirits of the world, and each one is trying to tell you who you are and how you should act and what you should believe and how you should spend your money. 
and you add to all those com commercials the electronic age and the tweets and the Facebook and the instant messaging and things I don't have a clue what they are. <laughs> And they chain us to these images controlling our desires and our behaviors. Wanting to find our sense of worth and values and morality. And if that's not enough, Monday morning you're going to face more legions. As you will hear words from your boss. And warnings of final notices from financial obligations and financial expectations. Is that not enough for you to believe in legions? There is more. There are words from doctors and there are medical tests and there are illnesses. And today I found out even my computer has a virus. <laughs> Aren't there some weeks where you think you have given all there is to give, and after you've given everything stripped and exposed, you still haven't given enough? Doesn't it seem some days like you're pulled in a thousand directions all at the same time, and no matter how hard you try, there are no solutions, at least not the solutions you would want and need? Aren't there days when you want to just rant and rave from this thing to the next, muttering under your breath words I will not repeat here? And when our strength and our desire and our reason is gone, we are exposed. Legions didn't exist just 2,000 years ago in a cemetery. The war of words still goes on around us, maybe even more so today than 2,000 years ago. But here is the wonder of Luke's story. And it's not just a victory that happened once a long time ago over against the Aaron Dem uh, Demonac. This is a story about a Jesus who still comes to unlikely places. And today he comes to La Hui Lutheran Church. And he still comes to unlikely people. And today he comes to you and to me. And in the midst of all those words and all those messages, in the midst of self-doubt and inadequacies and failures, incompleteness, not good enough feelings. That word of God still speaks. And today it is spoken for you. And it says, you are mine. But it doesn't just speak. It has the power to accomplish what it says. And all the things that would disagree, it binds and it shackles and it drops them into the waters of baptism. And it says, here is a new word. And this is the word I give to you this day. And the people see what happened. They go up to Jesus, this demon-possessed man. He's now sitting at Jesus' feet fully clothed. It's not that he's wearing clothes. Galatians, as many of you were baptized into Christ, have clothed yourselves with Christ. It isn't just the clothes he wears, but now this word becomes who and what he is. But here's the strange part. People asked Jesus to leave. I think they were all part of the Garrison uh, Pork Association of uh, Better uh, White Meat. <laughs> Their prophets are gone. They don't, even the man who gets scared of the demons is a little ticked. He wants to follow Jesus, go back to Galilee. He said, no, you can't come with me. Stay here. And all of its uncertainty and desires and the strangeness of every day of our lives. This God challenges us. Go home. Where you live. With your people. With your hopes and your dreams and your fears and your failures. And there, tell people, the word of God has come to you. It has claimed you, and it has the power to make it happen. And share with them that that word is also there for them. And live in the newness of this world. And the legions? 